Well, welcome to training class number six, Python for Loops from the Python Made Easy series based on Python 3.7. In this training, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about for loops, what they are, their basic construction, how to use them, why would you use them. We'll go into nested loops. We'll get right down into the guts. And as always, there'll be plenty of examples to support our training slides. As an added bonus for this particular training, we're going to get into how to create a secure password using for loops and some other wonderful Python functionality from the standard Python library. On this slide, we'll look at what loops are in their basic construction. A for loop is an iterator that can act on any items in any sequence. For example, strings, lists, tuples, dictionaries. The basic construction is what I have here in the middle of the page. This first line, four targets in objects. This is known as the header of our for loop. This assigns items to the target. The target is the iterator. It's usually a variable. This variable gets assigned to each of the items in the object. The object is that thing that we will iterate upon or step through while we're looping. The indented block portion here, statements, this is the block of the for loop where each object's item is evaluated and acted upon. Now note, there is also an optional else clause for for loops. It gets executed if the for loop exits without encountering a break statement. Break instructs the interpreter to exit the loop and skip the else clause if there is one. Here we have our first example of a for loop. We create a list to use as the object of our for loop. Our for loop header, 4i in list1, one, list1 one being our list. And in this case, it's the object. It's the thing that we will iterate upon. i is our iterator. It will take the place of each of the elements in list1, our object, for each of the three times we will iterate through our loop. Why three times? Because there are three elements in list one, our object. Within the block of our for loop, we have one statement, a print statement, that will print out each of our object elements, A, B, and C. Here is another example of a for loop. In this loop, we're going to make use of something known, known as the range method. So we have a counter set to zero, and we have 4i in range 10. And then we print the counter value and is the number now. And then we increment the counter up by one. So the range method, it generates a list of numbers which is generally used to iterate over items in a for loop. The rules are as follows. All parameters must be an integer. Numbers can be either positive or negative. It subscribes to zero-based indexing, meaning the first number in a series will be zero instead of one. The syntax is fairly straight ahead. We have a start, a stop, and a step. The start is the number to start at. The stop is our upper bound. We generate up to, but not including that number. And then we have the step is the stride, how many numbers to count by. For instance, if the stride was two or the step was two, it would mean access every other number in a sequence. For example, if I had four I in range two, 10, two, the first two would be the start. The 10 would be the stop, and the last two would be our step. So we would go to every other number in the sequence between 2 and 10, except for the fact that 10 is the upper bound, and that would not be consumed, right? So the output would actually be 2, 4, 6, and 8. It would go to 9, but that would not be consistent with our step or stride of 2. So if we look at the main piece of code here, 4i in range 10, print counter, and then a, a literal is the number now and then counter plus equals one, you see what happens every time we iterate through. First of all, we have 10 iterations between the numbers of zero and nine. We have no stride or no step. And each time it just prints out what the counter is for that particular iteration. And you see it goes in order zero to nine and it prints out our literal string every time. Let's see what special considerations there are for using a for loop with various different objects in Python. In the upper left hand corner, we have a list of tuples list underscore toop underscore one. We print the type to satisfy curiosity to say that it is indeed a list with three tuples inside. So we use four x, y, z. Now we have three iterators in list underscore toop underscore one. And you see what gets printed out are those three different sets of three numbers, one, two, three, three, four, three, and five, six, three. 
we would be able to manipulate those individual characters or those individual elements within the tuple if we wanted to. Moving over to the right, a sequence of tuples. Now this is clearly of type tuple. So here, same thing, 4XYZ in tuple 2, tuple 0 position prints out to the right hand side here, Rosie. Tuple 1 position is dog, and tuple Z position is beautiful. Then we go on to the next set of three, Chihuahua, Black, Brown, and Killer. So it goes right in a row as it iterates over. Now that's using three different iterators. What if we just used one? Tup 2, same thing. We have the same tuple here. So 4x in tup 2, and we're going to print them all together just using one iterator x, and you see what happens. It prints out the set of three, and then it prints out the second set of three. And here's a for loop with a dictionary. So we have dict1, apple is the key, one a day is a value, pear key, every other day value, peach key, only at the beach value. So for key and value in dict1.items, that's a convention. You'll see that key value or KV, K for the key, V for the value in dict1. And then we print just the keys, comma, key, the key iterable, and same thing for the values. And you see what gets printed out. Just the keys are all three keys, and just the values are all three values. And here we take a look at nested for loops. If you notice in the code to the upper left hand side, we have a for loop within a for loop. So let's go through this code. We have two lists up at the top, list one and list two. This code checks to see how many items from list one are also in list two. Note. This does not check how many items from list two are in list one. It goes one way only. In our for loops, for item in list one, item one is our iterator for list one, and item two is the iterator for list two. We have a res underscore list equals empty, so that's our empty list. It's in that list that we will append those items that appear in list two from list one. So we go through this four item in list one, it traverses peach, apple, pear, mango, and watermelon in list one. Then it goes four item in list two, orange, pear, mango, honeydew, and peach. If item two, our iterator from list two, equals an item from list one, so if item two equals our iterator item one, those are the individual elements of each list, then print item one is an item in common. Then append that item, item one, to our res underscore list, our resultant list, and then print that out. And you see in the lower hand corner, peach is an item in common, pear is an item in com common, and so is mango, and then it prints out the list. Now a more concise and efficient way to get this done is to use a for loop and an if statement as follows. For item in list one, for item one in list one, and then if item one in list two, append it, else, print the item and tell me it wasn't found. Apple was not found and watermelon was not found, but peach, pear, and mango were all found. So same result, just much more efficiently. And here is our challenge for this module. We want to create a password generator. The objective, create a 12 character password from the following string, Python 3 exclamation great. And it has to have the following properties. It must be exactly 12 characters, no more, no less. It must contain both the three and the exclamation point. It must not, we must not be able to read either the word Python or great when you generate your password like we can now. It must have at least one capital letter and it must use a for loop to get this done. Things that you may want to think about. How do we ensure that we have exactly 12 characters? As it stands now, that string has 13. How do we make sure we're not able to read the words? And how to make sure we include both the three and the exclamation? Stop the video now, try to solve it. Don't get frustrated if you get stuck, you go on to the next slide to see a potential solution. There's probably several, way several ways to solution this, but I have one for your view on the next slide. Good luck. So how did you do? Did you get it? Well, if not, here is my solution. So we start at the top with this greenish blue dot. My string is the string this assignment required us to use. Next, we have password as an empty string. We'll use that for the generation of our password. In the next line with the purple dot, I apply a slice to reverse our initial string, my string, 
This is the first way in which we'll ensure that we can't read the words in our initial string anymore. The next we have our header in this greenish dot. We use the rain function with the length function against our reversed string. This ensures we'll iterate 13 times the full length of our string. Next, I use a slicing technique that changes the order of our string such that we add the front of the string to its end. And beyond this, we also are using a stride of two, which means it skips every other letter. This keeps changing as we iterate over our string. This further jumbles our string. With the red dot, we add our rearranged string to the password string each time we loop. And that's going to get very long. In fact, it'll be 128 characters long by the time we're done. So here, in this final lighter blue dot, I take a slice of the newly created password to make sure that I take in only 12 characters. I could have used any 12 character slice as long as it met our requirement of the assignment. And you see to the lower left hand side, our code output indeed does lowercase, uppercase letters, a number, and a special character. Mission accomplished. I'm always trying to find ways to do things more efficiently. So here's an alternative. I did not need to go past two iterations to get the same result that we did in the previous slide. So here is the code with a slight change. I have my range set to two. By the second iteration, I already have a long enough password with all my requirements. Look down here at the bottom. This is the original output. If I put print statements in to be able to show us for iteration zero, I have eight characters and then iteration one, I have 15. By that second one, I already have enough characters. So if I just change this, I can make my code much more efficient and get the exact same result. Here I wanted to show you that slicing technique that we used in both the original and the alternative version of our code, which took the front of the code and put it to the back. So let's go through this. I use a much more straightforward example. I have a string hello. I have a password set to empty, and I have my range again going for the full length of our string. Now I have some print statements in there to be able to show you the code output for each of these iterations. So it's this code right here, this new equals rev and then the slice with the i colon plus rev with the colon i. So let's see what happens here. The first iteration, that's iteration zero, rev i colon equals hello and rev colon i is empty. So the first slice is zero colon, the second slice is zero colon zero. So it's hello plus empty string, the result is hello. Iteration one, which is actually the second iteration, again zero based indexing, the first slice is one colon, the second is zero colon one. So the first slice is ELLO plus the H for the second slice and that makes the word E-L-L-O-H at the end. And then we keep going like this, the second iteration, which is actually the third time around, L-L-O plus H-E, the third iteration, L-O plus H-E-L, and then the fourth iteration, O plus H-E-L-L, -L, which is O-H-E-L-L. -L. And that's how it kind of jumbles those words all around. That's what happens. I wanted to make sure that we were all clear on that. And as promised, here is our bonus feature. I always like to give you a little bit of something extra during these. This really is an advanced concept and we'll go more into these different modules later on in the course. But here is a way, a Python way to generate a secure password. There's something known as the secrets module. This is new as of Python version 3.6. This module is used for generating cryptographically strong random numbers suitable for managing data such as passwords, account authentication, security tokens, and related secrets. In particular, secrets should be used in preference to the default pseudo-random number generator in the random module, which is designed just for modeling and simulation, not for security and cryptography. So this is what you'd want to do if you have call to generate something that is security based. So let's go through this at a high level. First, we have to import both the string and the secrets module to make use of their functionality later in this code. This code, much like our other one, is gonna generate a 12 character password with at least one lowercase, one uppercase, a special character, and at least one number. So here, let's start at the blue dot. 
this blue dot is a variable. This creates a string of all the numbers, uppercase, lowercase, and all special characters in which we will feed our choice method from the secrets function. Okay, so this is courtesy of the string module. You see how these are all prefaced with string dot, okay? Then we have a while loop. In a range of 12 iterations, the green dot, secrets.choice will randomly choose a character from our alphabet string, thereby stringing together our password. But we're not done yet. Next we have this if statement with embedded for loops in it. This combo of if any ensures that we have an uppercase and lowercase letter and at least one number. The any method returns true if any element of an iterable is true. So we want all these things to be true before we print out our password and then issue our break. Okay, so it's really short and concise, but very powerful code using these two different modules to aid us. The output's going to vary each time we run this code because it's random. It's working off random technology. But for instance, this is the password that got created for me in this particular running of the code.